and let you know that um, just in the introduction that you made, I was so excited to be with such an active group. Uh, uh, it's very impressive. And so I'm hoping that we can uh, provide some level of information for you all. Um, we are so excited about having a program called Dismantling Res Racism in Healthcare with Expanded and Improved Medicare for All. Um, and we oftentimes we do these kinds of things for league members. So it's great to have another group that we can do this. We are going to take questions after the program. And so just drop your questions into the um, into the chat. That would be great. Um, as I said, this program is brought to you by, and I have to tell you, this is kind of a mouthful, um, Education and Advocacy Program for the National League of Women Voters Network, Healthcare Reform for the United States. Um, that's a big deal, but it is, um, that is the, the host of this uh, program. My name is Candy Birch. And I am a, um, a couple years ago, I retired to Gainesville, Florida. And, um, and so I've only been in Gainesville, Florida for a little bit. And uh, I was for the uh, longest time for decades in, in Johnson County, Kansas. And so um, there I worked with the league in many different responsibilities. So I got this Medicare for all bug though, when I came to Alachua County, Florida, and then all of a sudden I became a member of this group. Judy? And I'm Judy Estequist. I live across the Sound on Long Island. Let me stop my video. Um, and I'm the health chair for my local league and I'm an active advocate for the New York Health Act, which is a single payer bill that last spring finally got a majority of each cha chamber, the assembly and the Senate, as co-sponsors, but it wasn't brought to the floor for a vote. So the campaign is getting closer and closer. And if New York can get single payer, I think it'll be a watershed for the country. So we're hoping. And Barbara, as we said, will be joining us hopefully, and we'll just see, she's another one of our uh, leaders in this health care for all uh, uh, movement. So let us get started. Um, Judy, Barbara, and I are passionate about um, applying the racial justice lens to our current and proposed healthcare system. We are passionate about letting people know how effective a proposed single payer Medicare for all could be in fighting systemic racism. We first presented this program back in March of this year. And like so many, we were pretty focused on racial justice aspect of, of Medicare for All. George Floyd was in the news. Books like How to Be Anti-Racist and White Fragility were the best sellers. And the COVID vaccine was just beginning to be distributed. You will see the phrase systemic racism throughout the program and the data features examples of that program that continues today. But the more we researched it, the more we realized that our current healthcare system discriminates against so many. Yes, black and brown people, but also poor people, disabled people, and people who live in rural areas. So we added that concept that we needed to diminish, diminish disparities for all marginalized groups. No matter what, the league can be a powerful advocate in promoting single payer, extend, expanded and improved single um, Medicare for all. But remember that the league, how the league works. We wanna stress our nonpartisan status. The league neither supports nor opposes candidates or political parties, but it does support legislation after rigorous study of the issues. And so we are here to discuss Medicare for All as a public policy. And our Healthcare Reform Caucus has done a lot of study on this issue. Most developed countries recognize that, sing that healthcare is a public good, not just a consumer issue. Only single payer expanded and improved Medicare for All meets all of those qualities and fulfills the league's position. It's universal. It's comprehensive, it's affordable and therefore sustainable, it's fiscally responsible and equitable. Tonight, we focus on that last one, equity. And as this slide indicates, 
we want to dismantle systemic racism and other disparities in healthcare. And we hope that you as individuals in this group will participate in the political process that makes racial equity happen. Today, we will address these three topics. We are going to explore um, what's happening now. We're going to explore how single payer has been successful in the past, and we'll finish up with what we hope to do in the future. We hope to convince you that this important Medicare for All initiative deserves your support and advocacy, and we already know that we have that affinity be, uh, between us. Back in the 1960s, Martin Luther King understood the devastating effects of racism. In March of 1966, he said, of all the forms of inequality, in injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane because it often results in physical death. Because we agree with Dr. King, our caucus believes that healthcare one should be the highest priority. Two, healthcare is the domain where we can get the most bang for our buck. And three, healthcare can save the lives of our parents and grandparents, sisters and brothers, and maybe ourselves if we are successful. In this presentation, we hope to show you that the status quo, that commercial profit first marketplace intensifies systemic racism and other disparities in healthcare and health and in health. And we will show you how uh, single payer Medicare for all can fight it. In fact, we hope that expanded and improved Medicare for all will be the strategy that makes dismantling disparities in healthcare possible. We know that like league members, members in this group are pretty well informed. However, to many people, the facts that we may present may be shocking. I know that they were for me when I first got into it, but we are also very cognizant that the, mem that the numbers are the lived experiences of real people. So please know that we wanna be respectful of that as well. So we presume that you already are aware that systemic racism and disparities exist right now in the United States in both healthcare outcomes and healthcare delivery, and that it creates a serious public health hazard for all of us. You, may, you already know that in general, people of color live sicker and die sooner because they get less health care and poor quality health care. And as we will see, they tend to live in less healthy environments. But let's prove it with the evidence. This slide comes from the Physicians for a National Health Program, PNHP, you may be familiar with it. And it is the leading organization in the fight for a meaningful health care reform. Systemic racism exposes itself in the miserable health outcomes in the United States. Again, in general, people of color live sicker and die sooner. And using this 2017 data, the Centers for Disease Control determined that whites live three and a half years longer than African-Americans. And then along came COVID. According to this 2020 graphic, whites have lost about over nine months of life expectancy during the pandemic. But Blacks have lost over two and a half years, and they started three and a half years shorter. I was astonished to see that the difference in life ex expectancy in 2019 was 4.1 years. In 2020, we learned that whites have lived a whopping six years uh, longer than Blacks. Check out the deaths at the bottom of the, uh, per 100,000 at the bottom of this slide. Blacks have 35 more deaths per 100,000. And by the way, even before the pandemic, our European peers lived two years longer than Americans. You can't really read it, but the small print under that headline from Courthouse News Service says, one expert likened the life expectancy plunge to data not seen since World War II. And that is the largest gap between black and white Americans since 1998. That's just unconscionable. As this 
graphic uh, indicates, heart disease is the number one cause of death for all populations in the United States. Elevated death rates are also evident for cancer, stroke, diabetes, kidney disease, maternal death, et cetera. This graph depicts that black people die months sooner than whites. Please note that whites with heart disease live over 15 months longer than blacks. In fact, seven, in fact, every seven minutes, black persons, people die prematurely. And what's more, that's 200 black people a day who would not die if the healthcare of blacks and whites had equal access to equitable healthcare. This slide shows us not only how many months African-Americans lose, lose to various conditions in comparison to whites, but also that 86% of these differences could be improved with medical prevention and treatment. And here's another graphic. For every one of these conditions, more black Americans suffer and die earlier than white Americans. And all of these conditions are one, preventable when caught early, two, treatable when the resources are there, and three, manageable when there is adequate support. Note that COVID targets respiratory and vascular systems, making three of these existing conditions even more lethal. And now let's take a look at maternal deaths. You might be shocked at this statistic from 2016. For Black Americans, a whopping 63% of pregnancy-related deaths were, present, were preventable. And as the yellow arrows indicate, Black mothers are over three times more likely to die during childbirth. Unfortunately, the U.S. rate of pregnancy-related deaths, even for white non-Hispanics, is twice as high as in Canada where universal health care is provided. And remember, this is the lived experience of so many, and it's just wrong. Need more evidence of systemic racism? Let's take a look at the medical institutions that provide less health care and poor quality health care. Just a few months ago, Dr. Jason Goldman was on an NPR uh, program called Florida Roundup. He was talking about the vaccine rollout in the state back in the early part of that rollout. He was very clear about health inequalities. According to the American College of Physicians, one of the biggest determinants of life expectancy was your zip code. So we really need to target those who are most at risk for getting the disease as well as balanced and necessary functions of society. At a conference just this last January, physician and epidemiologist Dr. Abdul El Sayed said, the structurally racist environment has been beating up on brown and black people in our country for a very long time. He contends that our weakened public health system is unequal to the task of stopping the virus, especially in low income communities. And that is because the social determinants of health in people of color communities create conditions that for more disease and more comorbidity. Thus people of color are more susceptible to COVID-19 infection, not because of genetics, but because of social determinants of health caused by systemic discrimination in health and in neighborhoods, which is so evident before the vaccine was widely, widely distributed. However, healthcare in general remains poor for people of color. Social determinants of health are conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, work, play, worship, and, and age. And while this graphic is labeled determinants of health, health right there in the middle, it really shows impediments to health uh, for people of color and other marginalized Americans. Let your eyes skim over this graphic and imagine the stress that is built into it. Stress is a normal part of life, but when stress is persistent and it's a, a persistent daily experience, it exceeds our ability to cope. And physiologically, there is more hypertension, diabetes, and other health issues. Imagine how stress has affected people of color 
during the pandemic. And remember that their access to healthcare has always been limited. And to make it worse, a 2017 uh, study revealed that Blacks under the age of 65 were 50% more likely to be uninsured, which affects access and quality of health care as well. And oftentimes the racism is not even visible to healthcare professionals. This 2019 study study computer programs that doctors use to make decisions about which of their most at-risk patients would benefit from intensive follow-up care. It turns out that AI, the um, artificial intelligence, was radically biased, causing doctors to give their Black patients less care. Eliminating that racial bias would mean that Black patients, who are now only 18% of those getting that follow-up care, would instead be 47% of those getting that intensive follow-up care. Studies have shown that many white uh, medical professionals falsely believe that Black people feel less pain than white people, and as a result, make poor treatment decisions for their black patients. This slide refers to a tragic video from February, 2021. This black physician, a physician for goodness sake, is, is un, it was unable to convince her white physicians that COVID was causing her unbearable pain. They insisted that hers was a mild case and sent her home from the hospital. She died two weeks later from COVID-related issues. You even may remember this story from 2018. Even the celebrity status of tennis champion Serena Williams did not shield her from microaggressions and disrespect. Serena alerted her nurse about her history with blood clots, but they were initially, her alerts were initially dismissed. Even her celebrity status did not give her equitable or adequate health care. And now Judy will talk about healthcare care systems and their role in combating racism. Thank you. <laughs> not only can single payer Medicare for all reduce the, reduce the health disparities caused by systemic racism having to do with access, it has a track record of doing so. But first, let's discuss what improved and expanded Medicare means. So what are we talking about when we say single payer, improved and, improved and expanded Medicare for all? Let's start with what improved and expanded means. Medicare for all improves and expands traditional Medicare, the one that's currently available. First, it pays 100% of costs with no gaps or cost sharing or premiums. Two, it expands Medicare benefits to include eyes, teeth, hearing, long-term care, all essential care that, Medicare, that traditional Medicare doesn't currently uh, uh, cover. And three, it covers everyone, not just seniors, room to tomb. So I'll explain in a few minutes. It is structured like traditional Medicare, but it is not like me traditional Medicare. Similarly, both Medicare and Medicare for All allow seniors to see any physician and go to any hospital rather than being confined to networks, as for-profit insurance or Medicare Advantage does. It also requires very few prior authorizations and rarely has clawbacks on reimbursements. Finally, Medicare and Medicare for All, unlike Medicare Advantage or public options, are both examples of single payer which refers to who reimburses providers, not what's covered or who's covered. Let's look at a diagram. The top row has single payer programs. So these are programs inside the bright green box where the healthcare, where doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers invoice a government entity and are paid from public funds, taxes. The bottom row show systems with many payers, for example, when insurance companies reimburse doctors. These can be for-profit insurers, as in the US, or highly regulated nonprofit insurers, as in Germany. In the top left cell, taxes and public funding 
pays for health care that's privately delivered. That is by doctors who work for themselves or for private or public hospitals or for nonprofits. This is like our Medicare and Canada's and like single payer health care in Sweden, Taiwan, Australia, and many others. In the top right cell, taxes pay for health care that's delivered by doctors who are employed by the government and work in hospitals and clinics owned by the government. That's like the United Kingdom's National Health Service and also like our own Veterans Administration and Indian Health Services. VA doctors are VA employees and VA hospitals are US government properties. In each of these top row cases, the one payer is the government. It collects taxes and reimburses providers according to contract. In Sweden, Australia, Canada, healthcare funding comes from multiple levels of govern government, local, regional, provincial, federal, but that's behind the scenes. Patients don't see all the complicated invoices that Americans on Medicare see. Now we admire the Canadian, British, and other single payer systems because they're universal. They cover every resident cradle to grave. They offer a comprehensive set of health benefits with no haggling, no confusion. They negotiate drug and hospital prices centrally so that providers treating two patients in adjacent rooms who need the same health care get reimbursed at the same rate, rather than triple or 10 times the price of each other, as is now common in the US. They have reasonable overhead. This overhead does not include shareholder profit, tens of millions in executive compensation, huge marketing budgets, and complicated systems of plans and payments. Unlike our current system, providers won't pay armies of staff to figure out who to bill and what to charge. And they won't have to struggle with armies paid by insurers who refuse to pay. Now, turning to the bottom row, left-hand cell, German healthcare is overwhelmingly funded by taxes, but the funding is filtered through highly regulated nonprofit insurance companies. Coverage and premiums, benefits and costs are all standardized across these companies. On the bottom right cell is the US, unique in the world with its many for-profit insurers, each with dozens of policies and dozens of price points, each with different cost sharing and very different networks of providers all of them limiting access to specialists, tests, and treatments. The complexity is dizzying for Americans who need to choose plans. And that complexity serves profit-first profit companies whose business models depend on not providing healthcare. With healthcare the third largest sector of the economy, these companies have the financial means to defeat regulators. They surround every member of Congress with five paid lobbyists and their campaign contributions to both parties are equally oversized. When Medicare for All advocates talk about regulatory capture, they mean the domination of our government decision makers by corporate interests like healthcare. You in Connecticut know all about this. Fun fact, a few years ago, we saw headlines about federal regulations requiring hospitals to post prices. Like other hospitals, Cleveland Clinic objected. They have 70,000 services, which get multiplied by 3,000 rate schedules for different policies contracted to pay different reimbursements for different sets of benefits. And their posted list would be 210 million prices. The cost of that complexity, which has no health benefits, costs each of us about $2,500 per year. Let me repeat that. Americans pay more than $2,500 per year for administrative complexity. That's the how we get choice of insurer. In fact, we pay more for healthcare out of our taxes than every other country pays for all of its healthcare. And our total healthcare cost is double what peer countries pay on average. Yet for all these expenditures, which are 18% of our GDP, our health outcomes are worse than peer countries on many metrics, even for our white populations. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that US medicine is worse, just that Americans get less healthcare than we need and our health suffers. Deaths of despair, especially among rural and working class whites are driven by unaffordable healthcare. Over 50% of New Yorkers who have health insurance put off care because of costs. 
our health care is rationed by income. So what does Representative Jayapal's Medicare for All do? That's H.R. 1776. What does it offer? Well, it removes for-profit middlemen from funding, which cuts overhead. It reduces administrative red tape, representing about a 20% saving. It negotiates volume discounts to reduce, reduce drug prices, which are double the rest of the world's. So it reduces it conservatively 40%. It reduces total spending while providing universal health care, like Germany, Britain, Canada, to provide all their residents. And it sets medical need as the system goal and pays providers equitably, regardless of who is served or where they live. It calls for transparency and public accountability of all health policy decisions from a single funder, that is, the government. So, but that's a different talk. Some who oppose Medicare for all argue that our government isn't accountable, but our government has a remarkable legacy of using Medicare funding model to dramatically increase equitable access to healthcare, reducing racial and other disparities. Which brings me to our favorite slide. Please remember what Candy described, life expectancy for black Americans lags white Americans by six years. Now lags the life expectancy in OECD countries by eight and a half years. And American whites lag the Japanese by almost five years. The vertical axis on this chart shows the US rank in life expectancy against 16 peer countries. And the horizontal axis shows how the changes as Americans get older. At birth, the average American infant will die sooner than an average infant born in any of these other countries. The same at age 20, and for Americans at age 40 and age 60. And then suddenly, Americans who reach age 65 live longer. The life expectancy of our oldest, frailest, least healthy Americans climbs. By age 75 to 80, they will live as long as the top ranked countries like Japan. Why is that? Well, our life expectancy rises so rapidly because at age 65, all Americans, suddenly have access to comprehensive health care. Many of us getting prevention, regular diagnostic testing, and health care education for the first time in our lives. This is a public health issue. Now in a few minutes, think about this chart when we discuss the WHO recommendations for dealing with pandemics. Yes, Medicare has gaps in cost sharing, but this chart shows what universal comprehensive care can do. Imagine having it at younger ages. Another huge barrier to healthcare parity, discrimination. Despite separate but equal being the law of the land, President Truman integrated into the military, transforming the VA and changing the lives of black soldiers and veterans, as we'll see in a few minutes. For civilians, the first major non-discrimination law was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And Medicare was signed shortly afterwards in 1965. But what did Medicare, a single payer healthcare system, do for racial justice? Well, it created financial teeth to enforce compliance to equitable healthcare. Medicare said, you want payment for treating 19 million new Medicare patients? No me Medicare money will go to seg segregated hospitals. Few Americans remember the hullabaloo caused by this federal strong army. It's an amazing story. I learned about it from this documentary, The Power to Heal, Medicare and the Civil Rights Re Revolution, which all three of us recommend. And then I read the book. In just four months, a, govern a government office with just five staff forced desegregation of 2,000 US hospitals, north and south, east and west. Those five federal staff put out a call and scores of other federal workers volunteered to travel repeatedly to thousands of hospitals, risking violence and facing death threats to ensure compliance. Let me repeat, they did this in four months, but then Medicare enrolled 19 million patients using paper, pens, and the post office in just 11 months. Now it wasn't just seniors who benefited from integrated hospitals, Americans of all ages benefited. And remember my favorite chart showing the medical Medicare miracle that begins at age 65? 
Universal healthcare transforms lives and it didn't take years to implement. Tell that to medical Medicare for all naysayers. Now let's turn to the military. Medical care for veterans, as, as also for active duty soldiers and their families, is single payer, universal, and comprehensive. Racial disparities in kidney disease, dramatically reverse. Racial disparities in longevity, reverse. Racial disparities in mortality rates, reverse. Let's look at some numbers. The horizontal red line is the white norm. The columns for health outcomes of black vets that fall below that red line show black vets doing better than white vets on average. Better on overall mortality, that's how long they live. Better on new coronary artery disease events, that means fewer heart attacks. Better on strokes. Access to healthcare makes a difference. Universal care, where we're all in it together, makes that huge difference benefit every body. So what lessons have we learned from the pandemic? Well, BIPOC, that is Black, Indigenous, and people of color, have died at, of, color, of COVID at three, at triple to five times the rate of whites. So Sorry, just so I know, what's not filled in? Black, what? BIPOC? What's your question? Are you muted? BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, and people of color. I don't know what the other question is. Who have died at triple to five times the rate of whites. They die younger and they suffer more serious illnesses. This is not about genetics. They are more likely to be essential workers who are the most exposed, least insured, least likely to have sick leave with the fewest remote work options. And usually because they lack health healthcare access, they live with unmanaged chronic diseases that make COVID more lethal. So why do we care about BIPOC mortality? Besides their being fellow Americans and human beings, their vulnerability threatens our health, just like those who are vaccine hesitant uh, make, are, are a threat. When those around us are unsafe, our loved ones, our families, and we are threatened. Viruses ignore walls. So what's the answer? Well, it's public health expertise. In 2018, the WHO put out a playbook for fighting epidemics. Between 2011 and 2017, there were 1,300 epidemic events around the world. The US was the world hotspot with 36 of these, followed by Congo with 34 and China with 30. The WHO noted that climate change, human, humans encroaching on animal habitat and global travel means, and this is a quote, more frequent epidemics in the 21st century are spreading faster and further than ever. Outbreaks that were previously localized now become global rapidly, as fast, in fact, as an intercontinental aircraft flies, unquote. And the WHO offers 260 pages of guidance putting their bottom line advice on the first page. Let me quote again, quote, Ebola in 2014 taught us a valuable lesson. Global health security is only as strong as its weakest link. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Ultimately, it is the absence of universal health coverage that is the greatest threat to health security. In the end, prevention is not only better than a cure, it's cheaper. Unquote. So what do we do know from all of this? First, during the pande worst pandemic in a century, with over a half a million Americans dying and millions more infected, two big industries thrived. While Americans have gotten sick, gone hungry, become homeless and died, health insurers and drug companies have seen their profits double and triple. Let's be clear. None except the wealthiest Americans, the top five to 10%, feel secure about paying for healthcare. Our current healthcare system is broken and it's causing 200 black Americans to die early every day. With other marginalized Americans also dying too soon. Rural residents, Native Americans, mothers, infants, more. Second, we need to see healthcare as a human right, a moral right, a civic good, 
just like fire and police departments, paved roads, public schools and public libraries. A civic good that everyone uses when they need it. They use it as much as they need it with no co-pays, no means testing, no special passes. No one hears you've traveled 500 miles on your local streets this year, so you'll have to pay out of pocket every time you leave your driveway until December 31st. No one hears that your house fire is so bad we need to call another fire truck, but it's out of network, so sign this financial form or we'll let it burn. So we've discussed how systemic racism in our healthcare creates health disparities. Click. We've seen how Medicare forced hospitals to Medicaid integrate and how VA health outcomes demonstrate equitable care. And how both prove that universal access helps seniors and veterans live longer, healthier lives, regardless of their race. Now let's review the benefits that single payer expanded and improved Medicare can bring to the rest of Americans, but especially people of color on other marginalized groups. Our lives improve when our health care is universal for everybody because everyone has a body, comprehensive, covering all essential healthcare services, not just those that armies, that, not just those that uh, uh, are profitable, because those that are not profitable are the ones that are killing us. Maternity care, well baby care, behavioral care, substance abuse treatment, prevention and education, and ambulances. Private insurance do not care, do not cover these non-profitable services. Affordable, so that no one avoids care because of co-pays or prescription costs. Fiscally responsible, so we all get more health care and pay less with better cost control. Because almost 30% of that three and a half trillion dollars we spend on health care each year pays for armies of insurance bureaucrats arrayed against armies of provider staff. Eliminating that wasted cost and negotiating volume discounts for drugs will save more than enough to pay for comprehensive care for everyone. Finally, it needs to be equitable. Powerful people should get the same great care as the marginalized. Our governors get great care whenever they need it from doctors of their choice. And so should the guys who cut their lawns and the women who serve their lunch, the same great care. Doctors who support Medicare for All often say that programs for poor people are poor programs. And for a good program, look to Medicare. So what's our ask of you tonight? First, envision the end game. Think about Medicare, but for everyone, with no out-of-pocket payments and with all the gaps covered. It sounds too good to be true, but it's what other developed countries already provide. What actions do you recommend? And what can you add to this list? We think that joining with partners builds presence. PNHP and the National Nurses Union have doctors and nurses who mobilize and offer speakers. Healthcare Now empowers advocates. If you haven't taken their training, do so. Educating voters matters because, well, the ballot box is our major weapon against corporate capture, but it's a superpower if we use it. And the league recommends advocating across the political spectrum because people who learn about Medicare for All want Medicare for All regardless of their party. Everyone needs better health care. So Candy and I thank you for your attention this evening, and we'd like to open the floor for questions and comments.